Hello and welcome anyone that is joining me. I'm just going to give it a minute before I get started. Oh, I had issues with my camera, so we're all sorted. Anyone that's logged in, if you wouldn't mind just give me a little thumbs up in the notes to let me know that you can hear me, that would be great. Thank you. I'm going to dive in. Uh, well, it's 7.29, so I'll just give people a bit of time to join because it's meant to start at 7.30, and then we'll get going. Just going to wait for just a minute, just to allow people to give them an opportunity to join before diving straight in. Okay, so I'm going to get started just in the interest of your time. Um, but thank you very much for joining this session. My name's Catherine, and it's really great to have you here. I'm going to be leading the session on nutrition during pregnancy. So, first of all, I want to say congratulations to you for getting to this point. Uh, I think it's such a special place to be. Um, and whether it's your first time or you've done this before, I know the pregnancy space can be a really overwhelming space with social media and friends and unregulated websites and unregulated apps that are sharing lots of different advice. And it can be difficult to know what, be what the best decisions are for you and your family. So I hope to help with that in this session. But first of all, who am I? So my name's Catherine and I'm a registered dietitian. I'm a certified intuitive eating counsellor. And my area of interest is to help people maintain or establish a healthy relationship with food and their body throughout different life stages. And I run a private practice supporting people with their relationship with food. You can find me on Instagram at Nude Nutrition RD or my website is nudenutritionrd.com. The RD stands for Registered Dietitian. And I'm very much interested in the nutrition research, having done a master's in clinical uh, nutrition or clinical research, but in also to, um, I'm also interested in helping people to interpret that research in a way that's helpful and practical and realistic and healthy to digest as well, um, without that kind of common side serving of restriction and deprivation that tends to come with a, with a lot of the nutrition advice and information that we receive in, in pregnancy, especially. 
Um, I'm a female. I was born female. I identify as female and my pronouns are she, her. And I'm also currently six months pregnant myself. So I'm in my first pregnancy and I therefore have some firsthand experience of pregnancy too. Of course, up and, you know, just up to six months. Um, still got a bit of time to go. Um, and whilst I do my best to be informed of all of the different perspectives and stories um, of a wide and diverse population, I know that despite my best efforts, it's impossible for me to speak on behalf of everyone and, and all people. So throughout your pregnancy, you might have a different experience to what we explore in this session, and that's absolutely okay. Um, and always keep in mind that you are the expert of your own experience and you know your body best. Um, and finally, language is uh, really important to me, but it's, I know it's also important to the Positive Birth Company. And we recognise that whilst pregnancy can occur in people who have uteruses or pregnancy does occur in people that have uteruses, not all people that have uteruses are women. And so I will be using the term women and birthing people rather than simply women throughout this session and mothers and parents as well, rather than simply mothers. Um, so if you feel like I've fallen short in any way, then please let me know because I'm constantly trying to do my best. I'm constantly trying to learn. Um, and a little reminder, this session isn't intended to replace personal medical advice from your midwife, from your you know consultants, from your healthcare team. So of course, you know, I can't speak to your individual experiences, um, but I'll do my best to help you feel informed. So in this session, I'm going to be covering things that I think are relevant from a nutrition perspective in my 10 years of experience being a practitioner and witnessing the challenges that pregnant people face, as well as the things that I've picked up and learned and frowned at sometimes as well during my own journey. Um, so we'll look at some of the research and I'll offer some tips and ideas. It might be sensible to grab yourself like a notepad, um, pen, or somewhere that you can just take some notes, because I am going to be providing quite a lot of information. And it's important that you, you know, you leave this session with, with something that you can take away in action yourself if you want to. So I'm going to be covering weight gain in pregnancy, uh, what's normal, tips for navigating the system if you're living in a larger body. I want to cover a little bit on disordered eating and eating disorders because it's actually more prevalent than we think in pregnancy. And it's really important, I think, we touch on that before diving into the nutrition guidelines and what they say and what this means and things to be aware of, um, which I'll be talking about. Um, and then I want to touch a little bit on labour foods because I just think it's quite an exciting topic. And, you know, if you're at your final stage, of your pregnancy you might be looking for things to help speed things up so i'll be covering things in that order as well um so if you are watching this on record and you want to kind of move around then you know you feel free to do that so first topic weight gain in pregnancy um now i know this can be one of the biggest things on the mind of pregnant people uh, or some pregnant people and it's compounded by the fact that bodies change and this can be visible to others who can you know feel open to making comments so I want you to just take a moment or I, I invite you to take a moment if you want to to just think about what messages you might have received about your own body in pregnancy whether this be comments from friends family loved ones or maybe you've been weighed or you've been given guidance on how much weight you should or you feel you know you've been told you should gain in pregnancy and I just want you to think about how this has made you feel and whether it has had an effect on your eating in any way has it made you question yourself has it made made you second guess yourself I just want you to yeah think about your own experiences and in terms of weight gain the key thing that I want to highlight here is that weight gain is never an inherently a bad thing and weight gain during pregnancy is necessary and it's a good thing so most of the weight that you'll gain during pregnancy will be your growing baby of course but also the growth of a whole new organ so your placenta the fluids in your womb the blood supply to your placenta uh, or the, you know the additional blood that you create to uh, supply the placenta changes in your body breast tissue and you might also experience changes in your body in areas that just aren't around your bump and that's totally okay too maybe in your face maybe in your 
buttocks. Um, but I just want to reiterate that your body knows what it's doing. And I have heard some horror stories from clients and colleagues about people being told to lose weight during pregnancy, which is really not okay because that can pose risks to uh, both uh, you know you and the baby. Um, and actually restricting your diet or trying to control your weight or you know excessively trying to exercise during pregnancy to lose weight can actually cause nutritional deficiencies to both you and your baby and affect your baby's development and growth. So if a healthcare instru in, uh, professional instructs you to lose weight during pregnancy, then I encourage you to ask them to document that in their notes and ask for a second opinion. Um, because not only is weight loss really very rarely achievable or sustainable when you're not pregnant, being told to lose or monitor your weight during pregnancy isn't going to make your body sort of magically be able to produce less fluid or blood or make a smaller placenta. Um, so, yeah, your body knows what it's doing. Um, and there are lots of things that are outside of your control when it comes to weight gain. Um, in terms of how much weight you should gain, well, there's actually no formal guidelines. So the UK um, doesn't have any formal evidence based guidelines on what the appropriate amount of weight to gain is during pregnancy. And the, the US as well, they have recommended some weight gain ranges for each stage of pregnancy, but they're not black and white. And they, you know, they state that they need further research to support them. Um, so, of course, it's OK to have some awareness of your body weight and body weight gain. Um, and that's something that you can discuss with your you know, healthcare team, your midwife, midwife. Um, but you're, you know, if you're eating in a way that's working for you, you're moving in a way that's working for you. You're doing the best you can. It's normal. It's necessary to gain weight. Your body knows what it's doing. And it's not uncommon for healthcare providers to sort of make judgment based on your weight gain as to whether you're eating well or exercising well and we know that women and birthing people can gain weight appropriately and have very poor nutrition and likewise likewise they may gain above or below those kind of recommended limits and still have really great habits and lifestyle habits so i think discussions around weight gain in pregnancy needs to move beyond the scale um you might be weighed in pregnancy and the reason you might be weighed is to assess for certain health conditions um, and weighing, you know, uh, being weighed in pregnancy, it began as a strategy to make sure the parent and therefore baby was well nourished. Um, but if it's uncomfortable for you or being weighed is not good, any good for your mental health, then there are lots more sort of reliable and less stigmatizing ways um, for testing of testing for most of the issues that might arise during your pregnancy, including nutritional status. So if your doctor or your midwife wants to weigh you, then it's well within your rights to ask them why they want to and what additional information that's going to give um, you know, give them about you or your baby and whether there's another way of testing for that condition that could be more effective. So it's well within your rights to decline being weighed. Um, so just as a final reminder on that section on weight gain in pregnancy, um, prioritise nourishment, let your body do its thing, it knows what it's doing and pregnancy shouldn't be about specific weight, rather it's about making the safest home for growing your human. <laughs> um, which brings me on to the subject of, well, what if you're pregnant and you're in a larger body? Um, because it's not uncommon to be lumped into a high risk category purely based on weight or BMI, which is a measure of your weight to height ratio um, when all other mar markers are normal. Um, and this, coupled with the representation or, or the low representation of diverse bodies in pregnancy and maternal care, can leave anyone that doesn't really fit into that societal idea of what a pregnant body should be, which is the vast majority. There's a lot of people that don't fit into that standard. Um, it can leave you prone to feeling excluded or like you need to change your body in order to have a safe and enjoyable pregnancy, which isn't true. Um, but being of a high weight in pregnancy can impact how often you're monitored, your choices. So this is your cue to do your research, basically know your rights, know what you want, know what you don't want, and to listen to your own body and gut because you're worthy of having your needs met regardless of your size. Um, and unfortunately, weight-based discrimination does exist in healthcare. 
and feeling like you're going to be treated differently due to your size can feel quite anxiety provoking, which we don't need any more anxiety in pregnancy, right? Um, so being in a larger body in pregnancy, I think the thing that gets brought up is, is risks and complications and all of that. Um, but being in a larger body doesn't mean that your pregnancy is going to be any more complicated or dangerous or different to anyone else's. And we know that many of the conditions that are linked to um, that increased risk of being in a, when being in a larger body can occur in people of any size. Um, and the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, their guidance acknowledges that there are some risks associated being with a uh, being in a body with a higher BMI, um, but in the same line, it also states that you can have a healthy pregnancy if you're of a higher weight. So, um, if you're in your um, on your uh, in your second pregnancy as well, or third or fourth or fifth, the guidance in the UK um, it notes that most people will have uncomplicated pregnancies, and a study in 2013 found that previous pregnancies were a much more accurate prediction of whether you might require medical in intervention during labor than a person's body mass um, so that's just something to be aware of um, so rather than getting caught up in worrying about um, what might happen during your pregnancy I recommend just doing some research knowing your rights knowing what you want and knowing what you don't want and I've linked to some resources so I've linked to some fat positive pregnancy resources below this session um, that you can access for advice and support if this is your experience um, one thing that's really important to be aware of is um, is risk and that's the thing that's talked about most often, whether you're in a larger body or not, to be honest. Um, but it's important when it comes to understanding risks and complications in pregnancy, um, if you're in a larger body, um, it's important to understand what's meant by that risk. So there's a difference between a relative risk and an absolute risk. So to give you an example, if you're told that you could double your chances of winning the lottery by buying an extra ticket, but the, the original chance was one in a million, you've doubled your chance to two in a million. So yes, you're twice as likely to win, but the overall chance is still very low. And the same applies to health. So even if the higher there's a higher relative risk of complication during pregnancy, there might be a, still be a really small chance overall. So that doesn't mean that you're irresponsible to take that risk. And that's why it's important to know your rights, know what that risk means. And so if a doctor mentions risk related to your weight, then just ask them, well, what, what's the absolute risk, that exact risk, rather than the relative risk compared to other people? Um, so, yeah, have a look at some of those resources if that is applicable to you. I think you'll find them really helpful. So disordered eating and eating disorders in pregnancy, um, you might not think this is relevant to you. Um, and I know you're probably itching to get onto the nutritiony stuff. Um, but actually around 30% of people um, can, well, research has suggested that dis disordered eating can affect around 30% of pregnant women. And I say women, that is, you know, I say that uh, is women because that's the group of people that were researched. Um, and approximately 7.5% of women at their first ultrasound were suffering from a diagnosable eating disorder. And the interesting thing about this is that eating disorders and disordered eating aren't screened for, often aren't, pick, aren't picked up. Um, and so, it's, and it's also estimated that um, it's quite often underreported. So the stats I imagine are a lot higher so if we've got, you know, uh, 100 people listening to this, 30 might ha be having a difficult time. Um, and this can be due to messages that we receive from a culture about food and bodies. There can be a lot of pressure at this time, especially when the body is rapidly changing. So um, when it comes to knowing like what is disordered eating, what's eating disorders, I, I like to sit on a spectrum where you've kind of got normal eating at the end of the spectrum 
you've got diagnosable eating eating disorders at this end of the spectrum. So there's a kind of um, diagnostic criteria to um, being diagnosed with an eating disorder. And then there's a whole host of stuff in the middle. Um, and they tend to be the people that I, I often work with um, that just have a bit of a problematic relationship with food, but don't feel like they're kind of problematic enough to fall into an eating disorder category. And a lot of these um, behaviours are also quite normalised as well in our society. So these behaviours that can be more in line with disordered eating might be things like frequently dieting, having anxiety associated with food or eating, or feeling guilty about your eating or ashamed. Um, you might be preoccupied with weight or shape or size. Um, you might not be able to be around certain foods or have food in the house because you feel out of control around it. Um, you might feel like you need to exercise or eat less to try and compensate for what you've eaten. And so these could be some signs that you're displaying some difficulties with food. Um, and in terms of having an eating disorder, if you've got a current or past eating disorder, it's important that you make your healthcare team aware of this because attempting to avoid weight gain or engaging in sort of disordered eating behaviours um, with food can pose, could pose some risks to your baby, um, you know, could pose risks for you with depression, anxiety, but could also cause low birth weights, uh, miscarriage, preterm birth and problems like that. Um, uh, problems with milk supply as well and I don't say this to like scare you at all I'm saying this because it's actually a great time in pregnancy to kind of address um, address some of these things and get the support that you need um, so I have also linked in the bottom of this um, in the bottom of this live to a self-screening tool um, and that screens for eating disorders and disordered eating. So if you think this could apply to you, I would encourage you to go through that screening tool and see what it says. Um, if you're worried and feel like you need some support, then again, I've linked to some resources on where you might be able to seek some additional support there as well. And I think it's important to touch on that before diving into the nutrition stuff, because um, the anxiety about food um, and eating itself itself is it's almost you know more problematic than than how, than what you're eating if if that's occurring for you. So something to be mindful, something to look out for um, in yourself, but also maybe others around you as well. Um, so let's dive into some of the nutrition guidelines. So what do they say, and what does this actually mean? Um, and so I just want, I just invite you again to just have a think about your own experiences at the moment, uh, what stage you're at in your pregnancy, whether you're in that kind of first trimester and your eating feels chaotic or you feel sick all the time, um, or you only want to eat specific foods, or maybe you're in that kind of middle phase, that second trimester where you are expecting to suddenly feel better and you're not <laughs> um or maybe you are feeling better and you're able to increase your variety of foods eat that you can eat or maybe you're in that third trimester where you're struggling with reflux or um you know you're struggling to eat um, or you know sleep well or you're um you know you're wondering what sort of foods to gear up for for labor gear up with for labor so just think about where you're at and what your pregnancy nutrition is currently looking like. Um, and then I'm going to go through some things. So I often focus on nutrition from a gentle perspective. So really focusing on what you can add into your diet to help enrich and support and enhance your health rather than what you can kind of restrict and deprive and take away. Um, of course, there are some things to be aware of, which I'll touch on. Um, and it's important to kind of see that that those sort of partial restrictions on food from a place of self-care it's a short period of time um, but hopefully I can help you to feel empowered with things that you can be adding into your diet because there's a lot of weird and wacky advice out there and if you're cutting out foods or cutting out food groups it can you know set us up to not be in such a great place nutrition wise um, 
so the key thing in pregnancy is actually adequacy and it's making sure that you're, you're eating enough food um, and you're eating a wide variety of foods so that you're getting all the nutrients that you need to look after yourself and your growing baby. Um, there's no specific pregnancy diet. There is some nutrients that are important to consider, um, but there's, there's no kind of set diet that you need to be going on. So I'm going to be running through how to know how much food you need. A bit about fluid, a bit about protein, a bit about carbs, a bit about fats, fiber, some other nutrients to consider, and then labor foods. And I'll be signposting to any places that I think um, would be helpful for you to get further information. Um, so, yeah, you might want to keep taking notes on this section, uh, have a think about your kind of usual day or where you're at at the moment, and is there any scope to add anything or make adjust adjustments to your current day. So first things first, how much food do you need? Um, so in pregnancy, extra food is needed for the growth of your fetus um, and placenta and various maternal tissues, um, your fat stores, your uterus, your breasts, um, and changes that occur in your metabolism and the increased effort that it just takes at rest to grow your baby. Um, so I had a look on the NHS website and the Royal College of Obstetric Obstetricians and Gynecologists, um, and there was a recommendation to have an additional 200 calories in your third trimester and nothing else in your first and second. And I was a bit taken aback by that, um, by that kind of being advised because it kind of didn't match up with my own experiences of my own appetite so I went back to the textbooks I went back to the guidelines and I was really digging down into like where have these come from and what what why is that recommendation being made um I'm not an advocate of calorie counting um and you know there's a lot of flaws in calorie counting um there's there's limitations in you know there's uh, errors on food packets, there's variations in what we absorb and use as, individ as individuals. There's lots of, um, despite me talking about calories, there is lots of flaws in, in calorie counting. Um, but just as a little quiz uh, to get you thinking, I looked at what the total cost of pregnancy is. So from growing your baby from a cell all the way through to term, this is if you have one baby, by the way. If you've got multiple, then this is, um, I don't have the stats for that. Couldn't find them. Um, but what, how many calories do you think it requires for your body to, to grow a whole baby, including all the tissues uh, and all the changes that your body goes through as well? Do you think it's an additional 10,000 calories that your body needs over that nine or 10 months or whatever it is? Do you think it's an additional... 50,000 calories or do you think it's an additional 80,000 calories feel free to drop that in the notes if you want to throw a guess in um so I've just seen a question about sugar intake can it increase your risk of gestational diabetes eating sugar doesn't cause diabetes and um, there are lots of factors that can contribute to that um, including your genetics. So um, you may be offered a gestational diabetes or like a, um, a glucose tolerance test. In fact, you might get one of these, which is I, what I got through a letter um, to have a glucose tolerance test if there's a family history or if you've got um, sort of any genetic predisposition to that, um, but certainly not going to cause diabetes by eating sugar or bread or anything like that. Anyway, um, yeah, Jen, you're right. It's 80,000 calories. Um, that is the cost of pregnancy. So that's a lot of calories. It's a lot of energy that our bodies need in order to um, grow a baby. So the guidelines say, you know, an additional 200 calories, which is the equivalent of, say, half a cheese sandwich or four ginger nut biscuits or a banana and yogurt or a slice of toast with peanut butter, that kind of stuff. Um, but actually, when I looked back at the the guide, the kind of core textbooks, it said that our bodies require an additional 70 calories in the first trimester, 260 calories in the second trimester and 500 calories in the third trimester. Um, 
And the reason that the NHS and the Royal College of Obstetrics and Gynecologists recommend the additional 200 calories uh, only in the third trimester is because um, there's an anticipated, uh, they anticipate that women and birthing people will reduce their energy expenditure or activity levels during pregnancy. Um, so that's why they've kind of lowered it down. And I just wanted you to, you know, know where that's come from. Um, and remember that these are guidelines, there's limitations to calorie counting. So again, I don't really encourage it. Um, and if we were all robots, and if everyone was the same, and we could understand every physiological process that goes on at one time in your body, then yeah, perhaps you could recommend an exact amount of calories. But that's just not possible. Um, and it may you, you know, you may absolutely need more food and you may feel ravenous in your first and second trimesters. And it's important that you honour honor that. Um, as I said, your first trimester, you might feel like everything feels like chaos. You don't know what you want and then you do know what you want and it's really specific. Um, but it can be really unhelpful to be told that you shouldn't eat anymore or you shouldn't gain weight um, in your first trimester because this isn't always the case. And many women and birthing people do gain weight in their first trimester it's not in your control um, and everyone's different. So I wanted you to understand where those guidelines come from and to also allow yourself um, the flexibility to honour your body if you feel that it needs some more food. Um, and equally, if you feel that it doesn't, then that's OK, too. Um, so how can you if you're not counting calories, then what? how can you know how much to eat? Well, um, one of the most accurate ways to know how much your body needs is to try and be guided by your own hunger cues. So eating regularly, eating enough and establishing a regular and varied meal pattern will cover most of your bases nutrition wise. But if you've been dieting for a while or you don't trust your body cues or you've been guided by calories or meal plans or points or other sort of external methods to tell you how much to eat, you might feel a little bit out of touch with what your body's asking for. And this is where um, there's an evidence-based framework called intuitive eating that can help. And if you're interested in learning how to be more of an intuitive eater or how to raise an intuitive eater, because we were all once intuitive eaters and your baby is going to come out of you being an intuitive feeder. They're going to know how much food they want. They're going to turn their head away when they've lost interest and they're going to know when they're full and when they're hungry. We all have that innate ability, but it kind of gets bedded out of us as we get older because of the messages that we receive about food in our bodies and don't eat that and do eat this and this is bad and this is good. So if you're interested in learning more about that and learning how to get back in touch with your body and letting your hunger guide the way, then intuitive eating is a great um, place to start. And I've linked to some resources to help with that, um, some books and things, as well as how to raise an intuitive eater um below if you're interested but in terms of connecting with your own body so quite often people know what it feels like to be really hungry uh, and ravenous and then really stuffed so if you think about your hunger levels on a scale of 0 to 10 uh, like a fuel tank so zero is starving hungry there's nothing left in you and 10 is your you know you're absolutely stuffed you've had all of the you know, you've had a Christmas dinner and you've had all of the turkey and all of the stuff and you feel like you just need to lie down on the sofa and unbutton your trousers um, and uh, you feel really uncomfortable. Um, I mean, you might be unbuttoning your trousers now anyway, <laughs> with your bump growing. But um, it's never a good place to be at that bottom end of the spectrum where you're dipping into your stores your energy stores to kind of sustain you and then when you do reach for food when you're down there it can feel completely out of control so it can be helpful to try and connect with your body's hunger cues especially the subtle ones and if you think of it on that scale of 0 to 10 I always think of three two to four that kind of level is it's a polite hunger you could eat but you could wait half an hour is usually quite a nice time to start eating so with that in mind, I invite you to join in with some noticing around your own hunger right now. So if you were to rate your hunger level on a scale of 0 to 10 right now, where 10 is, you know, stuffed, 0 is completely empty, you're drained, um, 5 is neutral, you're neither empty nor full, where do you think you sit on that scale right now? 
Just have a think for a moment. And if you come up with a number, if you've got no idea, don't worry. It's, it's not an easy thing to do. Um, but if you have come up with a number, then just think about how do you know that? Did you go to the clock to decide what you should feel? Did you go to, um, you know, what time, when you last ate and how therefore your body should feel? Or did you clock in with your own body? Um, having listened to some of Siobhan's meditations, you know, they can be really a really great way to check in with yourself and, and learn how to kind of connect with your body. Um, so the different ways in which hunger might be showing up are in your mood. So you might feel hangry or irritable or have like low concentration. And that is, um, you know, probably quite far down on the scale at that point. You might feel tired or sleepy or sluggish. Quite often people say they have like a mid-morning or a mid-afternoon slump. Um, and actually, it's a sign that your body might need food. Um, you might have a headache or find it, uh, find you're kind of lightheaded or you're finding it difficult to stick to a task, you're distracted. Those are all signs of hunger. You might notice in your stomach, which sits just below your rib cage, it sits high, quite high up. Um, just up in the centre. In your stomach, you might feel like a stomach ache, you might feel a gnawing, a rumbling, a gurgling, and you might even kind of get a sicky or burny sensation that moves up your throat and, and your chest. Um, or you might just be thinking about food and salivating at the thought of food. Food just sounds good. Usually thinking about food, that's like the first sign of hunger. Um, and that's a time to think about, when did you last eat? You know, would it be reasonable that you might be hungry right now? Um, now, if that feels a little bit far fetched for you, then it might be helpful to just implement some gentle structure around meals and snacks. So I often recommend something called the guide of threes if you're stuck. And that means eating roughly three meals, um, three snacks every three hours um, and not really leaving any more than five hours between eating. So if you're stuck, you need some guidance, I would, you know, that's a, a good cadence to try and aim for. Um, and that might look like, you know, breakfast at eight, for example, a snack at 10, lunch at 12 or one, a snack at three or four, dinner at six or another snack before dinner, um, and then, you know, dinner later. So it's, it's kind of just feeding your body regularly. And a common mistake that I see is people not eating enough in the day because they're busy, um, you know, maybe trying to control food um, or you're at work, you're out and about and then coming through the front door and feeling, you know, absolutely ravenous and thinking, why can't I stop eating? What's wrong with me? Um, and so eating in accordance with those hunger cues or eating proper meals regularly throughout the day. Uh, can help keep your body happy, help keep your baby happy and help keep everything growing as it should. Um, so that's a bit about hunger, how much food your body needs. A quick note on fluid. So I personally found that I can't drink enough um, and I'll be drinking and drinking and drinking and think, oh God, why is my pee still quite dark? Um, so I recommend drinking to thirst and then checking the colour of your pee. It should be pale, straw colour not too smelly. Um, and if you're really stuck, then you can use the calculation of 35 mils per kilogram of body weight as a minimum. So that might be if you weigh 100 kilograms, for example, roughly, that might look like three and a half liters. So 35 mils times 100 times by 100. Um, you might need more than that. Again, just check the colour of your pee. That's going to be the best indicator. I know it's a nightmare having to keep drinking and then keep peeing. And it, you know, it's not ideal, um, but it's just it's how things are at the moment. Um, all fluids count uh, except alcohol. Uh, caffeinated drinks do count towards your fluid intake. However, um, you know, the evidence does point towards having two cups of caffeinated drinks a day or two cups or less a day to be safe. Um, so caffeinated drinks include things like black tea, coffee, green tea, cola, energy drinks. Um, and the NHS has some really nice guidance on the amount of caffeine in food and drinks, which I think I've linked to at the bottom as well. 
Um, other things that are good ways to get fluid in are even things like ice lollies and custard and fruit and jellies. They're ways of uh, your body actually gets fluid from those things as well. Um, of course, it's not going to get everything it needs from those from food, but they do kind of add up, especially as we're coming into the summer months or maybe you live in a hot country and, you know, um, or maybe you're just craving ice lollies like I did for a while. <laughs> um, I touched on alcohol. So alcohol is is not recommended. The safest approach recommended by the Royal College of Obstet Obstetrics and Gynecologists is to not drink alcohol um, if you're pregnant. And although the risk of harm to your baby is low, if you've had small amounts of alcohol before becoming aware that you were pregnant, we don't have a safe level that we know is okay to drink when you're pregnant. So just, um, you know, be aware. It can affect your baby's development and growth and the health of your baby um, and potentially your child's long-term health. So um, if possible, try and stay away from alcohol. Uh, protein. I've had questions before and should I be having lots of protein to kind of grow this baby? Um, and the optimal protein intake during pregnancy is actually unknown. And the guidelines suggest anywhere from additional um, ad kind of anywhere from about six to 30 grams a day extra. So what does that mean? Well, six grams uh, of protein is equivalent of like one egg. Um, and it may be that you need a bit more towards the end of pregnancy. However, protein def deficiency is very, very rare. Um, so as long as you're eating some protein every day, you know, a, a couple of your meals, I would say, um, if possible, in the form of things like meat, um, poultry, fish, eggs, beans, lentils, pulses, that kind of stuff, yogurts, milk nuts, tofu, those are all sources of protein um, and having a couple of you know sources of those every day in your diet is going to give you um, the things that you might need. Yes, vegetarians and vegan diets during pregnancy, I've linked to a resource in the bottom that you should be able to see that has, uh, there's quite good guidelines on the NHS website on just some nutrients to be aware of. If you are having vegan and veg, you know, vegetarian sources of protein lentils beans pulses the main thing is trying to just mix it up as much as possible to get all of the amino acids the essential amino acids that your body might might need um yeah if you're concerned then again just just being aware of what are the good sources of protein in a vegan and a vegetarian diet and where can you be adding them into your into your day um and it might be that you can just get a big source, you know, a couple of sources in one meal, or you might be able to spread it a little bit more evenly throughout the day. Um, I think it's really important to just remember if you are concerned, you know, your baby gets preference from for nutrients over you, and they're essentially like parasites inside of us. So even if you're not managing to eat much, or maybe you can only tolerate carbs, which I'm going to come on to, it's unlikely that your baby's going to suffer um as the nutrition that you get goes to baby first <laughs> and because they're so tiny they don't need that much um and you also have lots of maternal stores that your baby's going to draw upon so assuming that you have a, had a good balanced diet preconception you know um having a bit less protein or maybe you're going really hard on the carbs at the moment it's not going to cause any major issues unless you've come into pregnancy being on a very calorie controlled or restrictive diet um, if you're concerned then of course speak to a you know a dietitian uh, or a registered nutritionist for some support carbohydrates they are an important component of the pregnancy diet as well as a healthy diet in you know adult populations as well that aren't pregnant and they should represent around 45 to 60 percent of the energy that you consume in a day um so the key thing here is if you can try and include a good you know source of carbohydrates at most of your meals and your snacks as well so uh, carbohydrates include things like bread potatoes pasta breakfast cereals rice noodles maize millet oats yam cornmeal that kind of stuff um snacks could look like things like oat-based cereal bars or crackers toast cracker bread with cheese or with 
Marmite or peanut butter or avocados, whatever your favorite toppings are, or yogurt and granola. Just some ideas for some snacks that contain carbohydrates. Um, and for lots of people, I know that carbs seem to be the only thing that can help with nausea. Um, more specifically, white carbs, white bread, biscuits, pasta, things like that. Um, and because in our culture, there's a lot of carb phobia, um, it's quite relentless. We end up we can end up feeling a bit guilty about eating carbs or ashamed of eating white bread and things like that, which is you know, absolutely fine. Uh, it might make us think that we're um, harming our babies, but that's going to leave you in a bit of a tough position if the only thing you can stomach is toast. <laughs> um, so one thing that you might be interested to know is that all white flour in the UK legally has to be fortified with calcium and iron and B vitamins. Um, so that varies from country to country. Some flour in other countries is fortified with folic acid. I know the UK are fighting for that. Um, but in different countries, there's different kind of levels of fortification. And they do that because they recognise that bread is a highly consumed food in the UK. And they see that there are certain potential deficiencies and how can we kind of boost the population without them realizing it um so yeah white flour is still pretty nutritious and as i said baby gets preference for nutrients over you so if you are a bit of a toast monster at the moment then that's not a problem um unless you know unless it's going on and on and on and you're concerned um about your you know your dietary intake um another thing is um fats i'm gonna I've got about I'm at 45 minutes, but I'm going to I'm not going to go any more than an hour, by the way. And um, so if you do need to go at 45 minutes, then you can catch up on the next bit um, at another time because it's recorded. Um, but fat. So there's no official recommendations for fat intake during pregnancy. And one thing that we do know is that omega threes are quite important to ensure good growth of your baby's brain and nervous system. Um, and fat or like omega omega threes are found in um, typically found in things like oily fish, but we also know what comes in oily fish and fish is mercury, which can be harmful in pregnancy. So um, it's kind of finding a balance. And the current recommendations are to aim for two portions of fish in a week, and a portion is kind of like um, what fits into like. That finger size like that or a checkbook kind of size for anyone that has a checkbook these days <laughs> um but it's recommended to aim for two portions of fish a week one of which is oily and good sources of oily fish that are also low in mercury include things like salmon pollock herring sardines cod and mackerel and not king mackerel apparently king mackerel's got lots and lots of mercury in it um so if you don't eat fish or you don't like fish uh, or you've really gone off it during your pregnancy, there are other sources of omegas as well. So things like chia seeds, linseeds, hemp seeds, walnuts, rapeseed oil. They're not quite as well absorbed as fish, but they are still um, they are still sources of omegas. And also omega-3 is found in some uh, pregnancy multivitamins as well. And the main benefit of omegas is a component of the omega-3 called DHA or decosahexanoic acid. So um, the recommendations are to include around 200 to 300 milligrams of DHA a day. And you'll see that in probably in your supplement, your pregnancy supplement. If you're taking one, 200 milligrams is kind of the standard addition to these supplements. Um, so if you're taking an, uh, any sort of omega threes, just check the dosage is within that 200 to 300 milligrams of DHA um, and make sure that that uh, if you're taking a separate omega supplement, that it doesn't contain any vitamin A or retinol, which can sometimes be added and that can be harmful to the baby. Another thing that's important in pregnancy is fibre. So fibre or dietary fibre is a collective term for different plant substances that are resistant to digestion by our gut enzymes. So they form the bulk of our poo, essentially, um, and they help keep our digestive systems healthy. Um, 
and you can find fiber in things like fruits and vegetables and legumes and nuts and seeds and whole grains and they can be kind of heart health promoting they can help with constipation or preventing constipation and they can also risk potentially reduce risks of things like preeclampsia so they're a pretty great food all round if you can include them in your diet when you're feeling up to it um, and ways in which you can do this included things like um, high fiber breakfast cereals so wheat mix shredded wheat porridge oats going for the granary bread if you can um, if you like it um, potatoes with skins or even vegetables leaving the skins on them as long as you're giving them a good wash um, can be a way to add more fiber into a diet um, adding things like beans and pulses and lentils to soups and stews and curries and salads as well um have, having um like fruit fresh fruit dried fruit canned fruit um they're all absolutely fine to include in your diet um and things as snacks like um oat cakes um peanut butter on oat cakes vegetable sticks and dips and things like that um so a couple of nutrients to be aware of um I find it really interesting. One of the reasons that we can get constipated is in pregnancy is because we have hormones that slow things down. So the progest progesterone um, in our you know bodies can slow down the digestion or, or the um, yeah the digestion of food, and that can kind of slow down our gut. But what's great about it, what's really amazing about that process, is our body actually absorbs more stuff from our food, um, and that means when it comes to calcium which is another important nutrient, the recommendation isn't actually that we need any more because the body just increases the absorption from our food, which is so clever. Um, if you are a teenage, uh, teenager, if you're an Asian woman or birth in person, then you might be more at risk of um, uh, calcium deficiencies. And this can be because vitamin D status can be lower um in um in those groups of people so just something to be aware of um including good source like two to three good sources of calcium in your diet is is the recommendation in pregnancy outside of pregnancy so good sources of calcium include things like cow's milk sheep's milk goat's milk cheeses yogurts rice puddings malted milk drinks but also if you're having um, non-dairy sources so uh, plant-based milks plant-based products just making sure they're fortified with the calcium and they'll say that on the front of the packet um, there are also some cereal products some breads that are fortified um, you can also get calcium from things like tinned fish pilchards um, tinned salmon as well as um, some fruit and vegetables like broccoli oranges kale spring greens so including a couple of sources of calcium in your diet um, most days is recommended to get get what your body needs um, and then iron as well so most people don't need to take extra iron during pregnancy and taking routine iron supplements won't necessarily benefit your health they might even cause unpleasant side effects like heartburn or constipation or even diarrhea so you will have your you should have your bloods tested at your first booking appointment and then 28 weeks of pregnancy as well. And if you're experiencing any symptoms of low iron, fatigue, weak, weaknesses, shortness of breath, heart palpitations, then you can just let your midwife know and they'll test your blood sooner. Um, and you'll only be advised to take iron if you are found to be anemic or if you're in at increased risk of becoming anemic, um, maybe if you're carrying twins um or um your diet is less varied but good sources of iron include things like red meat um beans like kidney beans edamame beans chickpeas nuts dried fruit and then fortified breakfast cereals as well um so covered a lot I'm, I'm conscious that there's there's a lot there um so just to summarize there is no such thing as a pregnancy diet but there are a number of key nutrients that are important to include and you can get, um, or you should be able to get most of what you need for you and your baby from your diet. Um, eating enough 
food by following your hunger cues or if that's too difficult having those regular meals and snacks the the rule of three 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 um can be helpful drinking enough fluid and monitoring the color of your pee is important and then including a variety of different sources of proteins and starches and fats and oily fish in your diet being mindful of fish intake um as well as fiber iron and calcium so that's a little bit of a summary of that new, sort of nutrition part. You might be wondering about supplements. Supplements are uh, kind of recommended in pregnancy, especially folic acid and vitamin D. So again, I've linked to some resources. I think there's a good resource with the Royal College of Obstetric, Obstetrics and Gynecologists um, on supplements in pregnancy, which um, I don't have time to talk about today. Um, as well as food hygiene. So the NHS has a really great section on their website. I thought if I talked about that today, I'm just going to be regurgitating, you know, their brilliant resource that they have. So do check out the NHS website for um, information on, you know, the key considerations from a food hygiene perspective. And it is important um, to, try and, to, to try and follow that advice. Um, I'm just going to finish up with the labour foods, labour foods, because I think it's um, an interesting section, and I was really interested to explore the research behind the different kind of things that I googled and came across. Um, so, if you are in your final stage of pregnancy and you've been pregnant for what feels like a million months right now, um, then you might be feeling quite desperate to get labour going, especially if your due date is approaching or if it's past. So it can make sense to be looking to the internet or talking to friends and hear what they said about getting things going. So there are some things that I looked at. So um, pineapple. So um, in fact, I had someone say this to me yesterday that their partner was eating lots of pineapple to try and get labour going. And although pineapple is a great source of vitamin C uh, and fibre, um, there is a shortage of evidence to back up the claim that it can soften your cervix. So if you do like pineapple, it's sweet, it's refreshing, it's rich in fibre, but just don't expect that it's going to suddenly speed things up. Um, dates, again, so these are something that I was really interested to read about um, because I have I heard comments from different people on Instagram about dates and I looked into the data, what we know, you know up until this point. We know that dates are a really nutri nutritious food. They're rich in fiber. They're rich in antioxidants. And if you've been diagnosed with gestational diabetes, you might want to be mindful of the volume of dates because they are quite high in, in naturally occurring sugars. Um, but some research does suggest that eating dates in your third trimester may actually help induce or speed up labor, um, which is really exciting. So what it shows is that dates can affect the oxytocin receptors so if you've done the hypnobirthing course or you're going through it then you'll be learning all about oxytocin which is a really great um you know hormone that our body produces or chemical that our body produces and dates can actually help our muscles respond better to the oxytocin and they could make potentially make your um uh, your uterus um, you know, your contractions or surges more effective. So the studies were done in people that ha, uh, were at 36, seven weeks of pregnancy, and they um, had around seven to 10 dates per day from the 37th week. So that was the amount that was studied. The study is small, um, but they do say that it is safe to consume dates in women in birth and people that don't have contraindications. So if you want to give that a go, then go for it. If you don't like dates, then don't, you know, it it might not do the thing that happened in that study. Um, but it definitely does have some science behind it. The other thing I came across was spicy food. So, um, you know, many people claim that having like a fragrant Indian or a Thai or Italian dish might kickstart labor. But actually, there's no solid evidence to date that spicy foods can induce labor. And it might even cause you irritation in your gut or heartburn, which might be the last thing that you need um, in labor. Um, so if you like spicy foods, then definitely enjoy them as you usually would. But don't go forcing it down, expecting that it might get things going. Raspberry leaf tea. Um, Many people use this to facilitate labour and birth, and it has been used 
It was first documented to be used in the 1940s. So it's been around for a very long time. But there was a systematic review that was published in 2021. And a systematic review brings together all of the latest quality research. And they've shown that the, um, the evidence to support the use of raspberry leaf tea in pregnancy is very weak. And further research is needed to address whether it's actually effective at all. Um, and also, we don't know if there's any harm. So it's not possible to say whether it's safe. And there's a real lack of consistency in um, how much what the dosage of raspberry leaf tea would be effective, the time to take it. So it's just not something that I can kind of recommend. Licorice root is another one. It has a long standing history of use in pregnancy um, and of, of kind of kickstarting labour. But actually, this is one I would recommend avoiding um, and high consumption of it might actually lead to premature labour and potential health problems for your baby. So as far as the research says, it's best to steer clear of it. And then finally, there's a one there's one called black cohash, and that's a herbal supplement. And it's been used as a herbal remedy among Native American populations for many years. It might not be safe in pregnancy. And so pregnant people are advised to not take black cohash unless you're under the supervision of a healthcare professional, um, because the studies just haven't rigor rigorously evaluated whether it's safe. Um, so the bottom line is, no one stays pregnant forever. The baby's going to come when the baby's ready. And the only thing with a little bit of research to back it up um, could be dates. Um, and the rest is all anecdotal. And there's just not enough evidence to say whether it's safe. So um, if you are interested in other kind of non-food related ways of getting things going, then of course, it's best to speak with your midwife. So just to finish up, um, I really hope you found this session helpful. And I, I would invite you to just think about one thing you might take away from this session that you could potentially action, hold on to. Um, and you can always get in touch with me on Instagram. I'm at Nude Nutrition RD. Um, or my website is NudeNutritionRD.com. Um, there's me and there's also a team of other professionals that can support if you feel like you need a bit of more one to one. Um, as a bonus from for turning up for today's session and signing up for it, you're going to receive an email from the Positive Birth Company with a code to 10% uh, off of all their online courses. So make sure you check your emails, check your junk and um, sign up to, you know, sign up to re receiving your 10% discount off their courses. But thank you very much for joining. Um, and I hope you found it helpful. And uh, feel free to, you know, reach out to me on social media and happy to uh, answer any further questions. But hope you found it helpful. Hope you found it. Um, hope it's given you a little bit more confidence and reassurance about your pregnancy. And um, enjoy the rest of your evening or day wherever you are in the world. Thank you.